Okay, uh, photosynthesis, you guys, uh, is the backbone of uh, what we are depending on. We are alive, we are all alive because of sun, because of sun, somewhere in here, and photosynthesis. Okay, without sun or photosynthesis, we would not be on planet Earth. Put it this way. Okay, so photosynthesis is a process that converts solar energy into chemical energy. And it's that photosynthesis, it is an endergonic reaction. You remember that uh, from uh, previous uh, material, exergonic and endergonic reaction. Can somebody define endergonic and exergonic reaction for me? What is that? What is endergonic? Huh? It captures energy. An exergonic reaction, it releases energy. So the sun is hitting <coughs> chloroplast right here, and eventually these chloroplasts, which I needed for today, sun is hitting chloroplast right here, right, like Stanley Cup. Sun is hitting chloroplast, and chloroplasts eventually make glucose molecules, which you're gonna to learn today. And then those glucose molecules are consumed by you. If you don't consume it, it's consumed by a cow or sheep, and then we eat the cow and sheep. You see how the cycle goes? You say, oh, I mean, I don't eat any plants. I'm totally carnivores. Great for you. But again, the food that you eat has to eat the product of chloroplast. Am I making some sense, everybody? So directly or indirectly, that's why I just talked about that, photosynthesis nourishes almost all entire living world. Uh, allotropes, uh, allotropes are producers of biosphere. You all know what produces means. Producing organic molecules from carbon dioxide, which in the atmosphere you have carbon dioxide and other or inorganic molecules. And what are heterotrophs? Heterotrophs are us. Heterotrophs eat autotrophs. Hetero, based on your prefixes and suffixes, means what? No? No? You don't remember that from reading your prefix? Different, thank you. Different. Auto, it means automatic. Self. They make their own food. Plants make their own food. Plants. This is a heavy one, but anyhow. Plants, leaf, this is a cross section of leaf. A little bit of leaf, they cut it up. Just a little bit of it, and they put it here. That's what you're gonna see on microscopes today. But anyhow, uh, these are autotrophs. Plants are autotrophs, and then we are heterotrophs. Earth supply of fossil records uh, was formed from remains of or organisms that died a hundred millions of years ago, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs ate this. Right? They ate plant. And they died after hundreds of millions of years. Now you're driving your car. Right? Am I making some sense, everybody? It came from photosynthesis. It came from sun. Without it, you would not be here. Have you seen the movie Martian? If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about a little bit. Okay, uh, photosynthesis converts light energy into chemical energy of food. What is anatomy of chloroplast? Okay, so chloroplasts are found mainly in the cells of mesophyll layer, the interior tissue of leaf. Each mesophyll cell contains 30 to 40 chloroplasts, and then carbon dioxide enters and O2 exists, leaves through microscopic pores called stoma. Are you guys ready? These are, when you look at your slides today, <coughs> lab practical exam question as well, these structures, you see that pores, is called stomata. In the leaf, this is a cross section of a leaf. Okay, so this is the leaf on the trees. Carbon dioxide goes in, and what comes out, based on the what writing on the board? What comes out? Carbon dioxide goes in to form glucose molecules, right? Glucose molecules are made up of what element? Carbon. 
carbon, right? Carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. And what comes out of plants, leaf. That's why we have problem nowadays. In Brazil, they're cutting all of the trees. So there's no oxygen coming out. Eventually, you are going to suffocate on planet Earth. No oxygen. That's what the concern is. Right? Oxygen comes out of these pores. So you and I can breathe it for our mitochondria. You remember that? You, for your mitochondria, you need oxygen. We talked about this. Okay, so mesophia, oh, right here. Another thing that you should know between the outer layer cells and inner layer cells, the leaf of the leaf, one layer of cells in the here and one layer here. In between, this is called mesophile. All of that area is called mesophile tissue. Right there, mesophile tissue. And then in here, the cells have these green dots. What are those green dots? Chloroplast. Here is a transmission electron picture of chloroplast. Chloroplast. One of, you see them on the microscope. Here they are 20 to 30 of them. He said 30 to 40 of them in each cell. And here is a model of chloroplast. Am I making some sense, everybody? You all know what is available to you in the lab? I'm talking about some of lab material. Anyhow, here it is. So here is a mesophyll layer. I showed it, the, the, this is the leaf. We do have slide of this. I brought some slide of them today. Uh, hopefully you look at them. We'll look at it later. Uh, and then inside of these are the pores. What was the name of the pores? Stomata. Probably somebody's daughter's name. Why did they pick that up? Okay, so, and here you have chloroplast and veins. Do not worry about veins. And carbon dioxide goes in, oxygen comes out. It's called stomata. And right here are the chloroplasts. And he's showing you, the question is, what is the anatomy of chloroplast? Chloroplast has how many layers of membrane? Two. Outer membrane and inner membrane. Just like here. This is the inner membrane. And this is the outer membrane. Outer membrane, inner membrane. That's why they draw it like this for you guys. Okay, and then um, you have uh, stroma is, um, I'm go okay, let's go over the anatomy of it. Let's go over all of that picture, correlate that picture to the model here. Um, so this is the outer membrane. Then you have, um, one thylakoid right here. This is called the thylakoid right here. And then a bunch of them together is called thylakoids. And then they are connected together. All of these thylakoids are connected together, which is called granum right here. Granum. So granum is a bunch of thylakoids connected together. Each one of them is called thylakoid. Thylakoid. Then one stack of them. One stack of it's called thylakoids. When thylakoids connect together, it's called granum. And then the medium, the medium, the fluid filled space inside of chloroplast is called stroma, with the R in there. Not stomata, do not confuse them. Do not confuse stroma, the medium, which has sugar molecules in there, and DNA. Remember, these guys have their own DNA. Steven, are you with me? They have DNA. All of the DNA and sugar molecules are floating around in stroma. Do not confuse stroma with stomata. Two terms very close to each other. Stomata does not have R with that. How do you like that? But the Roma has R. Can you do it? Can you, Reno, can you do R? No, no. What about the Reno? You cannot say Reno. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Ryan, 
¿Qué dice Brian? Okay, so store Roma has R in there, that's a medium, if you would, uh, they're pointing at here. That's a transmission electron picture of, uh, you might see this again, uh, not next week, the week after that in your lab practice. So be familiar with these pictures. This is totally different than mitochondria. We've seen pictures, electron uh, micrograph of uh, mitochondria. Okay, so that's pretty much it, anatomy of chloroplast. I answer your question. A chloroplast has uh, an envelope of two membranes surrounding the dense fluid called stroma. Thylakoids are connected in sacs of chloroplast, which uh, compose a third membrane system. Uh, thylakoids may be stacked in columns called grana. Grana is plural, granum is singular. If you have to, granum. Okay, and then uh, chlorophylls are pigments. That's what you're going to do in the lab today. You're going to grind up these. You're going to grind up. You're going to grind up chloroplast, but when you're grinding it up, you're going to gr end up grinding up these guys. And when you grind up these guys, then you will see coral fields on your paper chromatography. You will see them today. Okay. So coral fields are uh, pigments that gives leaves uh, their green color um, that resides in the thylakoid membrane. Okay. Uh, how to uh, track? I don't know what this track means. How to track atoms through photosynthesis uh, scientific inquiry. Okay, photosynthesis summarized as following equation. Carbon dioxide, of course in chemistry you learn equation, a chemical equation has to be balanced, right? So carbon dioxide plus water plus light gives you, what is this formula? Huh? Yeah. Glucose, is that right? Glucose, oxygen, and water. That's what these are the end product of photosynthesis. This is what goes into photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide from air, water from environment, rain or stream or irrigation, and then of course you need light energy. What is the opposite of this formula? If I had the arrow, the arrow goes this way, right? Mm -hmm. If I had the arrow going this way, what would that be? Glycolysis. Huh? Is it glycolysis? Cellular respiration. Oh. Cell respiration. Cell if I had the glucose molecules plus oxygen, it gives you carbon dioxide. We just finished that material. Some water and the light energy is the energy that you allow to work. The it does not give you light. Mm -hmm. right? except some uh, fireflies. And of course, it gives you some energy. So you can come to the class, sit down, and think and learn. That's energy, you're spending energy. OK, so opposite of it, right here, I did draw it. Though. The overall chemical change during photosynthesis is a uh, uh, reverse of one occurs during cellular respiration. I did give it to you right there. Okay, the question is, some of the questions scientists were baffling about and thinking about a lot, that where does the oxygen comes from and where does the carbon comes from? Well, that was an obvious question. The carbon of photo, the glucose molecules, uh, the carbon comes from uh, carbon dioxide. The oxygen, we're wondering where the oxygen comes from, does it come from water? or does it come from carbon dioxide? So they made these radioactive. They made the carbon and oxygen radioactive, and then they saw oxygen of the water uh, is coming from the oxygen of carbon dioxide. And then they saw the water that goes into photosynthesis gives off the oxygen that is emitted into the atmosphere. I hope I'm making some sense. Okay, so these are what goes into photosynthesis carbon dioxide and water, they, these are what comes out of photosynthesis, glucose molecule, water, oxygen. 
the question is, this oxygen, where is it coming from? This oxygen or that oxygen? Of course, the arrows are, that was the question scientists were asking. The oxygen that is emitted to the atmosphere, does it come from the carbon dioxide or does it come from water? Well, they did radioactive material and the radioactivity showed up in, do you remember I said labeling and tracing? I talked about that. So they labeled this carbon dioxide and then they saw, voila, it's appearing right here. They, no, no oxygen was appearing here that was radioactive. So they determined that the oxygen of the end product of photosynthesis is coming from water. Oh, what did they, what did they up here? Uh, splitting of water, core class split water, <coughs> yes, into hydrogen, yes, and oxygen. Incorporating the electrons of hydrogen into sugar molecules and releasing oxygen as byproduct. Yes, of course, these oxygens can go right here and, of course, right here, the oxygen of the water molecules. So it is important that you know the fate of each one of those elements, each carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and of course oxygen. You should know their fate, what happens uh, in, in, the, uh, in the products of photosynthesis. Yes, ma'am. Um, Very good. OK, um, I think it's going to come up in a minute. If not, uh, well, oxidize, answer your question. Carbon dioxide is being oxidized. Okay, carbon dioxide is being oxidized to uh, just like uh, into sugar molecules, and then opposite of this, you remember in respiration, glucose molecules for quiz today. Respiration, glucose molecules is being oxidized. Okay, let's let's. I think it's coming up in the future. Uh, photosynthesis reverses the direction of electron flow compared to respiration. Photosynthesis is a redox process in which oxygen is oxidized and carbon dioxide is being reduced. I said it the other way around, I'm sorry. Water is being oxidized and carbon dioxide is being reduced. But uh, for cellular respiration, what is being oxidized? I just said it. Glucose. I just said it. Glucose molecule in cellular respiration is being oxidized. Okay, so water is being oxidized and carbon dioxide is being reduced in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is an endogonic process. We already talked about that. Energy boost is provided by that. Okay, here we go again. Uh, becomes reduced. Carbon dioxide becomes reduced, and then uh, <coughs> water molecule is being oxidized. Uh, the two stages of photosynthesis, uh, we have light reaction and Calvin cycle. In old days when I was a student, they used to call this uh, uh, light independent cycle. And when I was a student, I was confused. I thought this happens only at night. That is not true. Calvin cycle occurs during day as well. That's why they changed the name from light independent to Calvin cycle. Calvin was the name of the scientist who discovered it. Okay, so let's go over. Photosynthesis consists of the light reaction. Of course, doing light reaction, you need light. Does light reaction happen at night? Huh? No. Light reaction needs light, and it does not happen at night. Am I making some sense, everybody? However, Calvin cycle happens both at night and during day. Let's go over it. I hope it makes sense. The light reaction uh, in the thylakoid, the light reaction in the thylakoid split water, release oxygen, reduce. These are the uh, rundowns. These are the summary of what is happening in the light reaction when there is sunlight. When there is sunlight, these are the things that happen. Water molecules split. Uh, Oxygen is released, uh, reduced the electrons, except as the NADP to NADPH. For cellular respiration, you did not have that P. You remember that? Mm -hmm. For cellular respiration, it was NAD. 
becomes NADH. But here, you have a phosphate. This. In photosynthesis, you do have a phosphate attaching to the NAD. Uh, generate ATP from ADP by phosphorylation. The Calvin cycle in stroma, Calvin cycle occurs in this area. Light reaction occurs here. Light reaction occurs here. Calvin cycle occurs here, which does not need light. In the stroma, all of that area. It's called stroma. Okay, uh, Calvin cycle begins with carbon fixation. I need to talk about carbon fixation a little bit. It means carbon dioxides are being put together as glucose molecules. That's what carbon fixation means. When carbon dioxides are being put together to form glucose molecules called carbon fixation, incursion into organic molecules. And that's powered by ATP and right. NAD. Uh -huh. right. Of course, anytime, yes. Uh, he brought up a good point. When you have, uh, when you're, for example, you have five carbons and glucose have six carbons, right? Am I making some sense? So when this carbon is coming to attach to here, do you need energy for it or not? Remember, for endogonic reaction, you need, for endogonic reaction, you need energy. That energy is coming from ATP. Okay? So you will see this, uh, where ATP is being used and how sunlight uh, has an effect in it. Okay, here is a light going to thylakoids. Light, thylakoids, water into thylakoids. And of course, NADP is coming, and ADP is coming, and this is chloroplast, and what happens next? Right here, ATP gets out, NADPH gets out. What happens in thylakoid right here, you make thylakoid mix for you ATP and NADPH, and of course, water molecule is being split, being oxidized, water <coughs> molecule is being oxidized to oxygen. Then what happens? This is, <clears throat> can this happen without light? No. If you take that component out, and that's why this does not happen at night. This, this does not happen at night. So at night, plants do not make oxygen. If you, plants do not make, at night, plants do not make ATP of here, in this here. They do not make NADPH. Are you ready? Let's go to the reactions that occur in here without help of light. Still can happen at night. It can happen during day two, okay? What kind of reactions happens at night? And of course, you see the stroma. This is all stroma. All of this is stroma. This is thylakoid. This is stroma. Let's go. Here it is. <clears throat> A ATP and NADPH go through Calvin cycle, and you're going to learn some details of Calvin cycle, not too much. And then, of course, carbon dioxide comes up from atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, <coughs> carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is available to the plants at night and during day. Am I making some sense? It's in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. So it is available at night or during day. The only thing that is not available at night is this one. So this one does not occur. This is Calvin cycle. When I was a student, they used to call this light independent cycle. And I thought this happens only at night, which is not true. This can happen during daylight too. That's why they changed the name to Calvin cycle. Again, I repeated it two, three times so far. And then, of course, right here, with, uh, they take the plant, um, chloroplast takes the carbon dioxide and put glucose molecules. They did not draw, here we go, finally, okay. I said they did not draw the arrow for glucose molecules, but they did, they did. Sugar molecules comes out. That's it, that's all you have to know, pretty much. A few more details and then, that's it. Yes, madam. So it's not step one and step two, they occur like uh, separately? So it's not like it has to have a light reaction and then move to Calvin cycle. It's not step one and two, they're See, separate? Thank you for bringing that up. See what happens here, the thylakoids, 
make ample amount of ATP, right? So the only thing that is needed here from light reaction is ATP and ADPH. When the light, when the sun goes down, there is ample amount of ATP, there is a lot of ATP and NADPH. So the cycle, this cycle can go on at night. Am I making, am I answering your question or not? Yes, they are depending on each other. Am I making some sense? But this one can happen without light also. I hope I'm answering your question. This can happen without light. However, during the daylight, there's a lot of ATP right here waiting. Just waiting and waiting and waiting. At night, when there is no light, they go through the cycle and the cycle. Did I answer your question? But again, during daytime, during light day, this is also happening too. So if it runs out, it just stops? It runs out. If you run out of ATP, you take the plant. Out of sunlight, what will happen after a few days? It's going to die. Well, because there is not ample of this. But if you give it with a syringe, you give it ATP and ADP, <coughs> probably the cycle goes on. Probably. Of course, then what you're going to do with breaking down, you will see that when hydrogen uh, water molecules break down, hydrogen is needed for this process as well. Just like cellular respiration, we talked about hydrogen chemosmosis. You remember that? We talked about it. You need the hydrogen breakdown of hydrogen here as well. But anyhow, let's go and see the rest of all. Yeah, but I have a break. You guys do. Could a carbon atom that was once part of Albert Einstein be in you? All living things need to take in carbon containing molecules to fuel their activity and build their cells. This is true for busy students and for all organisms. Let's look at how carbon atoms move through the carbon cycle in the Arctic tundra. Carbon atoms from carbon dioxide are incorporated into living things by producers, such as this plant. Carbon dioxide enters a leaf, moves into a cell, and goes into a chloroplast. There, in the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide is used to make sugar molecules. The sugars can be used to build larger carbon-containing molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. In this way, carbon that was in the air is now part of the plant. When a plant is eaten by an herbivore, or primary consumer, carbon in plant tissue enters the primary consumer's digestive system. There, plant molecules are broken down. These small molecules are then used by the primary consumer to make larger molecules for building its own tissues. In this way, some of the carbon that was in a plant becomes carbon in a primary consumer. Similarly, when a primary consumer is eaten by a higher level consumer, some of the carbon in the primary consumer is incorporated into the higher level consumer. Carbon containing molecules in dead plant material, animal feces, and dead organisms are taken up by decomposers, such as fungi and bacteria. Decomposers break down these materials and incorporate some of the carbon atoms into their own bodies. We have now seen how carbon moves from carbon dioxide to producers, to primary consumers, to higher level consumers, and to decomposers. How does carbon get back to the atmosphere? During cellular respiration, carbon-containing molecules are broken down and ATP is made. Carbon dioxide is released as a byproduct and returned to the atmosphere by producers, consumers, and decomposers. Overall, this return of carbon dioxide by cellular respiration is closely balanced by its removal from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. The global carbon cycle involves living things on land and in rivers, lakes, and oceans. 
And by the way, considering the huge number of carbon atoms in each person, and how quickly carbon atoms move through the carbon cycle, there is almost certainly a little of Einstein in each of us. Okay, uh, is there any, that was pretty much the carbon cycle. Yes, you can watch it at home again, and then will another one, photosynthesis, okay. I didn't know we get a long break. Plants provide us with food to eat and oxygen to breathe. They perform this amazing feat by the process of photosynthesis. Let's take a closer look. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, which diffuses into the leaf through small pores, and then enters the cells. Inside the cell, carbon dioxide diffuses into the chloroplasts, where photosynthesis <coughs> takes place. Chloroplasts use energy from light to transform carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen. Zooming into a chloroplast, we see these flattened membranous sacs called thylakoids. Here, light energy is converted to chemical energy in the first phase of photosynthesis, the light reactions. The two green structures you see here are photosystems large complexes of proteins and chlorophyll that capture light energy. An electron transport chain connects the two photosystems. Notice the small mobile electron carriers that shuttle electrons from one large complex to another. Now let's take a closer look at the steps of the light reactions. The photosystem on the left absorbs light energy, exciting electrons that enter the electron transport chain. Electrons are replaced with electrons stripped from water, creating oxygen as a byproduct. The energized electrons flow down the electron transport chain, releasing energy that is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, into the thylakoid. In the photosystem on the right, light energy excites electrons, I didn't talk about any and this of these time yet. the electrons are captured by okay. an electron carrier molecule, NADPH. The high concentration of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid powers ATP synthase, producing ATPs. The light reactions in the thylakoid have produced two energy products, ATP and NADPH, that will now power the production of sugar in the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle takes place outside the thylakoids in the stroma, the thick fluid of the chloroplast. Are you talking At about the that beginning one? of the cycle, Carbon dioxide molecules combine with molecules called RUBP. The resulting molecules go through a series of reactions powered by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. Sugar molecules known as G3Ps are produced. Most of the G3Ps are rearranged back into RUBPs that will begin the Calvin cycle again. But the important product of photosynthesis is the remaining G3P sugar. Some G3Ps are used to build glucose, which can combine into starch or cellulose. Still other G3Ps form sucrose. And some of the sugar is broken down by cellular respiration using oxygen in the plant's own mitochondria, generating ATPs that can power other work of the plant. Excess oxygen diffuses out of the leaf through the pores, while more carbon dioxide enters. With three simple ingredients, carbon dioxide, water, and light, plants produce sugar and oxygen by photosynthesis, powering plant metabolism, and ultimately providing your fuel as well. Okay. Uh, this is the light that, uh, uh, the, you know, why, the question is, why do you see plants green? Because, and you will see another PowerPoint, because uh, the chloroplast, chlorophylls, they absorb all of these lights. You know, if you pass the light through a prism, I don't know when you were a baby, you saw a prism or you saw a rainbow. Okay, so plants absorb all of this light. Light, you know, a light has different wavelengths. And then it reflects this one. So that's why you see plants green. So it does not absorb green, it reflects green. That's why you see uh, plants green. Something is black, it means black is absorbing all of those. White is reflecting all of those. 
when it reflects all of those, you see that surface white. When it absorbs all of these colors, then you see it black. That's why in the summertime they say do not wear black because you're absorbing all of the light. It's hot. During winter time, you should wear black. It absorbs all of the light. During summertime, you should wear something light so it reflects the light so you cool off. I mean, you know, you've heard of these things just because of that. Okay, here is a light, comes up as I said, and the thylakoid absorbs everything, absorbs everything, everything except green. That's why you see plants green. Okay, so uh, animation light and pigments. Let's see, watch this one too. The thylakoid membrane in chloroplasts contains light absorbing molecules called pigments. Different pigments absorb light of different wavelengths. One pigment, chlorophyll A, absorbs mainly blue violet and red light. This molecule participates directly in the light reactions. Another molecule, chlorophyll B, absorbs mainly blue and orange light. We do not see these absorbed colors when we look at a leaf. Instead, we see the green light lines that are reflected back from the leaf or transmitted through it. Okay. So I think you have enough knowledge. It goes, it goes, it goes, it goes to the grain or uh, like, I mean, yeah, the whole it, it goes through a you know, this is granum, yeah, yeah. but this is thylakoid. Thylakoid, 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 and the thylakoids are connected together. It's called granum. Right? So the whole thing is called, the, the whole around it is a... Uh, Membrane? Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is called chloroplast. Yeah, okay, no, the, then the, you have the stroma on the inside, and then those are the thylakoids. Uh -huh. It's also all of them together is called a granum. 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 There is one stack of them is called granum. Oh, the whole stack is called granum, <coughs> and then all together is called granum. Okay. Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, let's go over this one. You're gonna deal with this machine today, uh, spectrophotometer. Light passes through, and whatever he absorbs and absorbs and it reflects some kind of light and then when it reflects the light it measures it and it gives you a reading and that's what the spectrophotometer is measures the pigments ability to absorb various wavelengths of light and then we have three of them i think we only use two of them today and i'll tell you what to do and i'm in the lab let's work it together this machine sends light through pigments and measures the fraction of light transmitted at each wavelength here they are. I can go to YouTube and show you a few things about this machine, but um, let's not worry about it. Uh, what are different chlorophylls and their functions? Yes, that's what you're going to do today. Uh, chlorophyll A participating in photosynthesis directly. Let me draw this so you have some idea. If I have a beaker of water, you guys, and then you have two oil in my flask, like this, and then flask A, flask B. Flask B has a straw, flask A has a funnel. Uh, you all know what I'm talking about. Which one of these flasks is more efficient if you want to put the water from here to flask A or B? Which one is more efficient? Huh? A. A is more efficient than if I want to pour that water into B. A is more efficient. So this would be chlorophyll A. This would be chlorophyll B. This would be xanthophyll. This would be carotene. Doesn't matter. So all other different type of pigments, chlorophylls, chlorophyll B, carotenoid, and xanthophyll, they absorb light and they give it to chlorophyll A, they absorb water and they give it to the stem of the funnel. Am I making some sense? And then of course this part is participating in photosynthesis. I'm making an analogy. 
I'm making an analogy. The other type of chlorophylls absorb light and they give it to chlorophyll A. And chlorophyll A is the one that participates in photosynthesis directly. Here's a wavelength of different type of chlorophylls that we uh, discussed a little bit. Chlorophyll B, chlorophyll A, carotenoid, and then they don't have xanthophyll. Xanthophyll should be around here. Okay, here is the structure of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Um, don't worry about it. I just thought I'd put it up here for you guys. You don't have to memorize that structure. Uh, and then um, this is the, and we'll talk about these on Monday. Okay, let me tell you what you need to do for the lab. It's a little bit more involved.